is up, guys? This is Roberto Rojas, and I'm super excited to introduce you to the first ever episode of What an E-Vision, the first ever podcast dedicated to Paraguayan football in English. I am super excited for something that I think had needed to be done. I think definitely needed to give the exposure that Paraguayan football needs. But uh, without further ado, let's go into some of the guests that we have here to talk about everything that's going on in the world of of football in Paraguay. Firstly, let's go all the way to the mother country and go to the person that kind of suggested this idea uh, to all of us. Uh, let's go to Paraguay, to Fede Perez. Fede, how are you, man? Good, Roberto. Nice to see you. Nice to see you Sensi there. Nice to see Raf also. Uh, hi to everybody. Well, first of all, thank you all for joining this crazy idea, this, this idea that we're going to uh, do every week. There's going to be an episode every week. Every, every week, the people are going to have a new podcast about what's going on with our players, our Paraguayan players around the world. New players that are coming out of Paraguay also. There's this beautiful connection with, with MLS lately, with European football also. So we're going to talk a, a lot about those things, how they're doing. The, the, the top leagues are starting again. There's a, lot, there's a lot of going on this year also with qualification for the next World Cup starting. So it's going to be an awesome year. Uh, 2020 it still has a lot of football going on uh, besides COVID-19. So there's a lot to talk about on this year. And this is a new spot for that. So start enjoying it and, and let's, let's go for it. There's, there's a lot to do. Great stuff. Great stuff. Let's go all the way to stateside of where I'm based and let's go all the way to South Florida and uh, go to our two guests who are based in the same city. But firstly, let's go to our second guest here, Maria Britos. Maria, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, guys. Super excited. How are you? I am like like Fede said, this is uh, something that we needed to, to do, and I'm glad that we uh, were able to get together and, and, and finally put together. There's so much to talk about um, and we'll show the world who Paraguay is and the potential that, that we have and that our players have. But um, uh, just ready to talk football and have fun. Definitely. That's the most important thing to have fun. And before we get to that, let's go to our final guest, also based in Miami, you know, wearing colors that, you know, Arsenal are playing this weekend, Ralph, but you know, we're not here to talk about the guns. We're not here to talk about what Mikel Arteta is doing, but we're here to talk about La Avi Roja and everything going on in Paraguayan football. Ralph Hanna, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Hey, Roberto. Hey, guys. Good to be here. Yeah, this is the Albi Roja Adoptada. They adopted uh, red and white because uh, I've been I've been a Paraguay fan well since I first went there in 2003, um, and I'm really happy to be doing this show and and finally got this chance to do something uh, to give Paraguay football to people in English to give it some more exposure. I think like Fede was saying, there's so many different things going on. We've got a busy schedule. We've got Copa Libertadores. The league is coming to a a closed the apertura, the, the domestic league. We've got the World Cup qualifiers, so there's plenty to talk about, and um, it's going to be an exciting time to to try and showcase all of this amazing talent, football, the history as well of Paraguayan football, and, and share it with all you guys. Absolutely, absolutely, and well, let's go into that. Let's go real quick into what's going to happen uh, in within the next few weeks. Obviously, the start of World Cup qualification for Qatar 2022. It is scheduled to begin in October. FIFA had already confirmed that those matches will come about, but of course, nothing is certain in this type of pandemic that we're living in. So we just have to wait and see. But of course, if everything goes into schedule, we will play our first game against Peru at the Defensor del Chaco, and then taking on Venezuela in the second game over there in Venezuela. So without further ado, I think the let, let's go to Ralph real quick and, and start this conversation off. Certainly, there is a huge player pool that Eduardo Berizzo has to go through. You know, he's already been in charge for over a year now and, and certainly has had uh, time to, to check out the many players that he's had at his disposal. Uh, certainly, I think a big discussion that I'm, I'm seeing across Twitter, seeing across WhatsApp groups, seeing across a lot of people um, who are working and, and involved in Paraguay football about the first lineup that we'll probably see against Peru. But you know, I'd like to entail this conversation to you first, Ralph, and talk about some of the players that perhaps are certain of a spot 
uh, on this national team. I, I think we can go with some obvious names um, like Miguel Miron at Newcastle. I think we can go for the captain, Gustavo Gomez, uh, Gafito Fernandez, who had a bit of a controversy with VAR a couple of days ago, but certainly will be someone that I think would be deserving of that starting role. But, you know, just talk a little bit about that. And, and in your opinion as well, who do you see as someone that definitely has to be in the squad uh, for these World Cup qualifiers uh, that start next month? Wow. Um, let's see. It's first, it's very difficult to try and pinpoint who Barriso would like for the, for the World Cup qualifiers. He sees so many players since he took charge. Um, I think for me, Almiron is, is the first name on the team sheet, but then from there, it's, it's going to be hard to guess. Um, in terms of my opinion, um, I've been interested that since Bruno Valdez got injured, so he's, he's not able to play in these qualifiers, is, is think about who my, who my partner, Gustavo Gomez, um, and who might be playing in defence. You've got, you've got kind of rivalries across the defence between maybe at left back, it could be Arsa Mendia, who's playing in, in Cerro Porteño and, and has been performing very well. But then you have a very exciting player, Blas Riveros, who's playing in, in Switzerland. And Riveros is, is a very attacking left back um, that could be more suited to, to how Berisa wants to play. On the right-hand side, you've got somebody like Juan Escobar, who's doing really well with Cruz Azul and, and has become kind of an important uh, player for that team. And, and Cruz Azul are, are doing surprisingly well uh, in the Mexican League this year. Um, and then at centre-back, you know, we have uh, players like Balbuena, who's at West Ham, but isn't playing much. And then you have somebody like Alderete, who's, who's actually played the most minutes, I think, in, in Europe uh, over, over the course of last season. He's also a partner of Riveros in, in Basel, in Switzerland. Um, and, and then, you know, there's, there's people talking about local players. What about Juan Patino, who's doing really well with Cerro Porteño? Does, does he deserve a call-up? Um, so I think just looking at defense, before we even go anywhere else, there's all these kind of discussions uh, to have. I mean, of, of the players I've been watching recently, I, I've really been impressed by Juan Escobar and how he's grown into his role in Cruz Azul, not just as, not just as being a defensive player, but also as, as a leader of that team or one of the key key players of the team that they rely on. And I think that's something that Paraguay, having a young team, really need is, is those characters in the dressing room that, that can help them in the difficult task that's going to be these World Cup qualifiers. And certainly, I think a lot of people would want to make their own suggestions and their own players. I think it's important to start off the, with the right foot. Um, obviously, you, you don't want to go into a World Cup qualifying process, especially starting at home. And, and given the, the near miss that they had four years ago, they certainly don't want that to happen again. Um, you know, Maria, go into you real quick and, and just talk about, I, I think, more than just these players that we're probably going to see. But I think the expectation, I, I think we understand that, you know, having missed the last two World Cups, it's, it's important for us to start everything on the right track and, and not go back to what had occurred in the last two World Cup qualifying process. Um, you know, if I remember correctly, the first game that we had played was with a 1-0 win to Venezuela, uh, away to Venezuela, and then a 0-0 draw to Argentina. So certainly that was a, a, for a promising start that obviously ended in a bad way. But I think it's important to go into these first two games, especially looking at the opponents that we have in November and then obviously in other months, that um, you, know, you want to start off well and, and you don't want to fall into the first hurdle. Yeah, um, ab absolutely. I uh, I think we have the first two games that we start with Peru and then Venezuela are, are definitely going to be uh, tough opponents. But uh, I think it's our chance, uh, it's Berizzo's chance to show Paraguay, um, the fans, and, and, and also Peru and Venezuela that, that we're here to, to, to kick butt. And uh, we have to change, um, the, the team has to change the way that, that they're playing, a little less defensive and more attacking. Uh, they're lacking a lot on the attacking side. And um, it, of course we need to, to defend, but we need the goals. Without the goals, we don't go through. And um, I think that's what happened the last time that we had to qualify, we didn't qualify because we weren't attacking. So um, I think other than that, um, we, the, the team needs to show um, more aggressiveness 
and more ganas, you know, <laughs> to say it in Spanish, but, um, you know, they, they, they need to demonstrate that we are the team that, that have been one of the best um, besides Argentina, Brazil, um, and even Chile. Uh, I mean, we can't get left behind by Venezuela. That was just unacceptable. And it, it took a, a, a big hit on all of us. And um, I think uh, now is the chance uh, for Veris to finally just uh, even look at other players, like um, um, I know you're about to mention um, later on, we're going to talk about um, other players that Berito has in mind and has been keeping an eye on, but uh, even going outside of, 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 of our usual players, um, changing it up a little bit, I think we need a little bit more of uh, that dynamic that we're lacking. And certainly you look at the player pool that we have, uh, Fede, going into the discussion real quick, you know, as since Bediso has taken charge of this national team, he's used 44 different players, which brings kind of the question of what is the best team? You know, Maria had mentioned, you know, you want that team to have the best attack necessary and the best creators there. 14 goals already scored in, in these games that he has in charge. Certainly he has a huge player pool to use, but I think that's always that big question about what is the right team that Berizzo wants to use. We haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen a side where consistently you could be assured that is the right lineup to use. But, um, you know, looking real quick at some of the players that we've used, um, and, and I'm looking at them real quick. You know, you had mentioned the defense, but you look at midfield players such as Richard Sanchez, who has done well at uh, Club America. You know, you look at someone like Matias Rojas, who's did well at uh, Racing. And then on the attacking prize, I mean, you know, you obviously mentioned Almiron. You've got players like the Romero twins. And, and I think the big question I think now that we've seen is who's going to play at striker? Because I think that that's going to be one of the big questions heading into this World Cup qualifying process is who is going to be the starting striker? You know, we look at Antonio Sanabria, who's going to come back at Betis. You look at Dario Lescano and, and Carlos Gonzalez, who are performing well in Mexico. Raul Bobadilla, who's had a great year so far at Club Guarani and, and Sebastian uh, Ferreira as well, who's done well at Libertad. I mean, certainly Beriso has got a lot to work for, but uh, it's all about finding the right player that, you know, like Maria says, to find the goals and to get those those three points, or should I say six points, uh, in the bag for the first two games. Yeah, well, I think Beriso has been looking for the style, first of all, in, in this team. He's been trying to put his concepts into the players. That, that's why he's been trying to to always have the same players along alongside him with him, but he's also been putting in players and players, and you know I think he's kind of confused the people uh, of what the, the starting team might actually be for for what's coming up. But hopefully he has a lot of strategy behind this, uh, thinking that that some players might be good for some games and other players might be useful in, in other games. I think that's on his mind actually that this is a road. Uh, a very long road to the next World Cup and that you have matches uh, every other month and you don't play regularly uh, and, and there's another Copa America coming in next year so he's going to have more time with, with, with his players he's going to he's going to have time to work more and more. The, the thing is, what does Berisa really want on, on his team? Does he want young? Does he want young blood? Does he want players that have already used, used this jersey? You know, a lot of things that have caught my mind. Uh, he, he called up uh, Roque Santa Cruz for last World Cup, and we, we thought Roque was done. We thought Roque Santa Cruz didn't want to play anymore for the national team. He, he didn't play that with the, the Copa America. He took another experienced player like like Oscar Cardoso that you guys haven't mentioned, but he's still playing here in Libertad. So you have those young players, you have those players that have experience. It, it all depends on what Berizzo really wants. He has a lot on his radar. He's seen, uh, he's seen a lot of players he, since he got the role. Uh, I think he just needs to cut his, this list, uh, probably get married to a spot of 30 to 35 players. Testing time is up, I think. And now it's time to win at home, uh, uh, mainly, and, and get some good points when, when we have to get uh, away from us Asuncion is going to be a tough uh, qualification. I, I think there's teams that, that have been working a, a long time before us. Peru is one of them with, with Gareca. That's going to be our first uh, our, our first match. Uh, that's a team that you have to put a, a lot of strategy behind it because, uh, like I said, Gareca already has his team. The, 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 his players already know what, what, what his coach wants from them. And I think we're still on the way 
to get to that uh, on Berizzo's side. But but he's but he's done a, a good filter to see the to see most players, and now it just depends on him on what he really wants. Striking wise, there's a lot to choose from. Sebastian Ferreira, like you said, uh, is right now the, the the top striker here in Paraguay. He's he even has more goals than Roque Santa Cruz than than, than, than Raúl Bobadilla that has that has an injury problem. We'll see how he gets to this first match uh, on Copa Libertadores. So we're following the day to day. There's players that are playing all also on their leagues, they have this rhythm. Uh, there's players that are starting to, to play now. There's players that haven't played in a month. So Berisso has a lot on his mind. I think he needs to put a lot on, on the weight to, 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 uh, to, to, to get, to, to, get it, to this team that, that we all need to see against Peru and against Venezuela. Maybe even picking two different teams like, like some coaches actually do also. I think it all depends obviously on that first game so yeah it's a good point I think we have to see that you know you have all these players but you have to cut it down into a squad that will work out best for certain games and different styles Peru will obviously approach the game uh, one way and Venezuela will approach a different way so I completely agree but you know Fede continuing on to a player that had been on Eduardo Bediso's radar a player that uh, had recently just gotten his nationality um, his citizenship in Paraguay and that's Gaston Jimenez the 29-year-old defender, uh, midfielder playing at Chicago Fire. Uh, you know, a player that had already played for Argentina in a friendly uh, in 2018. He moved from Vélez to the United States this year. You know, and I'm seeing a bit of what he's done. You know, I think he, he has a really good left foot. I think he's very gifted in the technical and, and, and physical areas of, of the game. But, you know, here comes the big question. Um, you know, what, do we feel that Paraguay need another defensive midfielder, especially now looking at the players that we've had such as, you know, um, Richard Sanchez, you know, you have Jorge Morel at Guarani, Matias Villasanti, who's done well so far at Cerro, uh, Angel Lucena over there as well, Andres Cubas, you know, another Argentine-born Paraguayan who's playing at Nimes in Liga. You know, does Jimenez fit in that style? And, and do you feel that it would only be right for him to get a call-up spot uh, in these next games for the World Cup qualifying? Well, it's nice that you, that you called up Andres Cubas. He just left Argentina. He's going to play in France now. So, so these guys are, are growing also. Uh, uh, Ralph mentioned uh, Richard Sanchez also in the midfield. Those are players that are growing. So, so those are players that are, we're following. Uh, I think Berizzo already has him on the radar. Uh, because of that, Nunez, Christian Nunez, also changing teams. Now he's going to play from Vélez to Lanús. Players that have already worn the jersey, that, that, that have already shown what they're made of. I don't know if, they, if they've convinced anybody yet. Uh, in, into into winning their spot in the team, uh, but he but he might try with this with this player with Gaston Jimenez. He he already has some experience. He 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 was playing really well on this Vélez team before going to Chicago Fire. Uh, I, I, he's gotten some 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 playing minutes on Chicago. It took him up. Uh, it took him a while to get to get to a starting role, but he but, but he looks like a like a strong midfielder, like uh, like the the kind of midfielder like that Berizzo likes defensive but also a, a player that's very intelligent there in the midfield and that can connect the team with Almiron with the strikers which is something that we've needed he's he, that's a spot uh, particularly that he's that he's changed and changed he, he also tried with Morel a, a midfielder from Guarani uh, that, that that a lot of people here in Paraguay like so I don't think there's really one player for that specific role yet, the defensive midfielder. Uh, so I think he's still looking for that. And Gaston Jimenez has, has looked pretty well uh, on this Vélez team, for, uh, above all in this in this last play that, that we've seen him. And I think he's he's ready. He he he's from Formosa, which is everybody that knows where Formosa, Formosa is. It's just a, a little spot away from from Paraguay. I, I believe that his parents are also from from Paraguay. He he got the chance to play yeah. for Argentina, but but he wants to play for Paraguay now now at this stage of his career and I think Berizzo has already called him up so he's ready for it he's ready for the challenge he's waiting for the call and uh, he, he has a, a, a pretty good age to come and bring something to this national squad also definitely in can the I prime just, of his career I, yep go ahead Maria sorry can I just add that um I did uh obviously I was looking at um Gaston because I wasn't familiar with him but um you know going to Chicago uh right before the pandemic he didn't get a lot of minutes, uh, obviously, because the whole thing happened and uh, everything stopped. But um, now that, that they restarted um, again, the MLS, he, uh, he has been playing very well. I, I, I watched a couple of his highlights. Um, he's very, very aggressive 
he likes to create chances. Um, it, it looks like he likes to just go for it and, and, and create occasional goals, even though, you know, he, he can be right in behind the line. And um, I don't think he's uh, scared to just, you know, uh, go with the, with the flow and, and create chances. And I think that's what Paraguay needs, uh, especially in, in the midfield area. So he can also help, obviously, the front line. So I, th I think I, that I, that's just my, uh, what I've seen from him. <laughs> Yeah, I agree as well. I've seen some of what he's done, you know, nine games, two assists already to his name. And again, you know, he's at the right age. I think he obviously brings something different to the table. And obviously he is a bit of a, of a question mark because obviously we haven't seen him as much until he did get his um, citizenship. So yeah, I think it does bring an extra depth to the side. And again, I hope he, he does get his opportunity and hopefully we do see him on that list uh, come October. So let's stick into his story. the year. His story, yep. Roberto, could be similar to, to that of Jonathan Santana that, that did an awesome career here in Paraguay. We can, can compare it with what he might actually do with, with other players that have also been successful in, in, in our national squad. I, I think he's going to have the chance eventually. I'm not saying he's going to be on these first two, two games because he hasn't practiced with the team. He hasn't been close to the squad lately. And I think those, those players that have, been, that have been close lately to the squad, uh, uh, there's, there was even a, a couple, a group, a, big, a very big group actually, of, of players that, that are not in activity yet from Argentina, from the Argentinian league. And they were practicing with Barisa just a couple of weeks ago. Maybe they have an advantage for these uh, first couple of games, but on the radar, th there's a lot of players, and Gaston Jimenez might be one of them also. I think there is an embarrassment of riches that Barisa will have to use, and but certainly we will see in the list that hopefully he'll make in the next couple of weeks. But obviously talking about now leagues that have restarted or are going to restart, we'll go straight to England and talk about the Premier League. Certainly we have two players that obviously deserve a mention, two players that obviously have in their in their right spots being contention to play on the national team but two different scenarios i think we'll talk about uh ralph i'll go to you first you know being the englishman that you are i think you follow the premier league well as all of us do as well but you know we have two different situations we have miguel miron at newcastle and fabian Maduena at west ham for miggy it's a situation where you know he's come in into a side that i think has had quite a an interesting ride ever since he joined uh in Tyneside. Uh, just last year, you know, under Rafa Benitez. And, you know, it took him a while for him to start being the player that he is or starting to see uh, under Steve Bruce. You know, he ended up being top goal scorer in all competitions last season, which certainly gives him quite the, the advantage in terms of importance on that Newcastle team. But, you know, clearly he will be one to watch out for. And for Fabian Balbuena, a player that initially had had a lot of playing time under their former manager, Manuel Pellegrini, uh, but then it started to lose a bit of his his position as, as a starting role in the in the defense. And comes in David Moyes, and now he's being uh, sporadically used at the Hammers. It's going to be interesting to see that both teams will play against each other in the first game on Saturday. So I just want your opinion in assessing the situations of both these players uh, heading into the start of the season. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think your your assessment of of both players is, is spot on. Um... Almiron, we thought maybe that with Steve Bruce, who plays more defensive football, would he fall out of favour? Would he would he look for maybe somebody who was who was a bit of a, a bit more physical, a bit more athletic? And at the beginning, I don't think he had that trust in Almiron that he would play him wide rather than want to play him in the middle. But I think as the season grew, he began to use or give Almiron a lot more freedom to move into the middle, and he became far more effective. And like you said ended up finishing the, the top goal scorer in all competitions. Newcastle have, have picked up two very good players in, in the off-season now from, uh, in Ryan Fraser and Callum Wilson. I think particularly Callum Wilson is, is somebody they needed that, that has a bit of experience and has scored goals in the Premier League because that's something that they were lacking. The fact that Almiron was a top scorer suggests that they didn't have a striker and I don't think Jolton was, was able to be that player that they, they needed up front. Um, but for sure, you can see that Amiron is a key figure for, for Newcastle. You would expect him to play to play a big role. I, I imagine he starts at the weekend as well. Uh, in contrast, like we said, Balbuena was, was very important under Pellegrini. I think at one point he was one of the players with, with most clearances or you know, most interceptions. He was, he was, he was lead, you know, almost leading the league ranking in his, in his first season. 
Uh, he's he struggled more with Moyes. Moyes has, has only used him now and again. And also, what we saw with West Ham is as they as they survived last season, they they started to pick up defensively when he wasn't in the team. So obviously, for him, it's going to be much harder to work back to get into that into that starting eleven again. Um, something that might work in in Balwena's favour and, and pretty much for for anybody is that they've had a very short preseason because of of the pandemic. Um, this preseason is much shorter, so there's the chance, of course, that players um, might find it harder in terms of recovery time. So those that were playing towards the end of last season might actually need to be eased in in the first few weeks. So that could be something that works in Balwena's favour. We'll we'll have to see. But I think it's it's crucial for him that he needs to play to then be thinking about the the national team because as Fede was saying there was a whole group of players that were that were training with Berriso that got into some rhythm and I think he's going to prefer that over somebody who's who's not playing at all um, and especially in his position actually I think one player we didn't mention before is 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 uh, Robert Rojas who plays for River Plate and he's somebody who could be looking to to partner uh, Gustavo Gomez as well in in the heart of the defence and he was training with that with that group just a couple of weeks ago so we'll see um but yeah definitely going to be an exciting game uh, at the weekend to see how these two teams one may be overachieved in in Newcastle and one is one may be just survived but seems to be on the on the up which is which is West Ham so it should be a good game with and hopefully both our Paraguayans take part and I think, uh, obviously, Maria, going into that, I think Miguel Maron, given the attention that he's been gotten ever since, I think, you know, rising from Cerro Porteño, going to La News, going to MLS and flourishing at Atlanta United, and now going to Newcastle, where, let's be feel, I feel like the popularity is that we always want our best players to play in the best leagues. We already see that in Miguel Maron going to Newcastle. So, and, and clearly, it wasn't someone that obviously failed. I mean, you can't just have be the top goal scorer and say that, he underachieved and he definitely did help out a lot, but um, I think it's important for them to, to get on the right track and for, for, for him in this case, as well as for Van Wen, if he gets the opportunity is to get that continuing playing uh, time. And, and of course that helps him further for his opportunities on the national team. Um, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um... He's uh he's definitely earned his uh his time with the national team. So um, I just I think that it's just you know we have to see how Berisso wants to play him. Um, uh, we've seen a couple games before, but um, like we mentioned, we have to see if he wants to change around. If he wants to make maybe Almiron the 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 star of the team, because um, I think that he's uh, shined uh very well but yeah i think he's uh he's gonna do well i don't see why not um he's shined definitely in in mls and uh, with premier league he's starting to warm up a little more so yeah i think so and and going into obviously our other player that we have to talk about that is also going to be starting their season on the weekend it's antonio sanabria the 24 year old striker who comes back from his loan spell playing at genoa in italy goes back to betis under a new Betty side, a new Betty side that will be under Manuel Pellegrini. Um, certainly a player that had already proven at his young age of what he's able to do. You know, he came into from the roots of La Masia and Barcelona and then working his way up to going to play in Italy and then obviously going to Spain where he's at playing at Sporting Quijon and now back to Bet Betis where hopefully if he does get that opportunity, um, I think he can get consistent playing time and It'll be interesting to see if he debuts on the weekend at Alaves, but certainly for Sanaria, still at his young age, not even in the prime of his career. Um, I, I think it's a perfect opportunity for him to get the trust back. Uh, I'm going to go back to you on this again, um, for him to regain that trust under a, a manager that hopefully can get the best out of him uh, this season. Uh, yeah, I think um, I'm, I was very actually surprised that he didn't get too much time with the national team because um, he played very well with uh, with Betis. Uh, gotta be honest, I haven't checked him um, with Serie A, but uh, with uh, Genoa. But 
I think he, with Betis, he really did uh, show what his potential can be. And obviously with that, you're playing in, a, in, in top uh, competition like Europe, it's, it's got to be something that, that Verita has to take into consideration and um, with the team. And uh, we'll see. I, um, he, he could play, I think he could play uh, well with uh, Almiron. I, have, I, have, I, I truly believe so. I think they could make a good combination as well. I agree. Now, going into another competition that will begin next week, it is the Copa Libertadores. The Copa Libertadores returns on Tuesday. And, and certainly looking at the Paraguayan representatives that we have, we have three of them. We have Olympia playing in Group G. We have Libertad playing in Group H. And we have Guarani as well. Um, you know, certainly, Fede, I'll go into you this one. Libertad come into a situation where, you know, they're undefeated. They've fallen a bit much under Ramon Diaz so far after having such a great start in the local league. But uh, now they, they, they start to be hot and cold into the restart ever since the, um, the restart of the league had occurred. Now they go into a match where, you know, looking at the differences between both them and Boca Juniors, their rivals only separated by two points, a win for them at home would definitely assure them into the round of 16 of the Copa Libertadores. And certainly for something like that, it would be great confidence. And, and also looking at Boca seem that had been infected with COVID-19, meaning that they will have such a, of an increased weaker side when they do arrive in the nation. But I think Libertad um, are in a, in a good spot to get the three points and then get a great result uh, against uh, Boca on Wednesday. Yeah, especially if Libertad does what it needs to do, which is score goals here at home. We'll see how, how they do in that sense, playing at Cerro Porteño Stadium. That's where they're going to do their home games uh, from now on. Uh, Ramon Diaz hasn't gotten the hang of his team. He, 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 he brought a lot of players in at the beginning of the season uh, that he had trust on. Uh, a left win. He, he he brought somebody in midfield also, and and he made them play right away. And they didn't live up to the to to the, to the expectations. And he, there's even a player that that left the squad due to a personal problem. Also, Milesi, he's out for the for the Copa Libertadores. He's out for for the for the rest of the season. That's what they're saying from Libertad. So not all things have been well for this Libertad, like you said very well. It went from hot to cold because it started really well the year. I. I I think Ramon was getting the hang of the team right before the the, the host uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, I think he he there was a game in Colombia where 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 we saw the best of this team, I believe, especially playing away, which is really hard on, on Copa Libertadores to do. And, and they got a, a, a three points there that were very important. They're gonna try to make that make that more valuable if they get a, a strong win here in Asuncion against this Boca. Boca that has way too many problems. It's probably the South American team with the most problems going into this Copa Libertadores is starting next week. And Libertad should take advantage of that. I'm going to be straightforward with that because, because Boca is going to come where they haven't practiced. Uh, Libertad has more than 10 games uh, on their shoulders. It, they haven't gotten where they want to be uh, on the Apertura. They, they wanted to be first. They were first before, before the pandemic uh, uh, stopped the, the schedule. But but now the, they're still fighting for it. They're waiting for Cerro Porteño to, to lose. Cerro Porteño has won 10 straight games, so it's been hard to, to keep up also. But, but Libertad has shown that they have a, a strong squad. They, they, they change players, and, and they always get, get a, good, uh, a good vibe, a good sense of that they can win games because they have that. They have a really good squad. They have a president that, that, that's putting a lot of money into making that squad, into having this coach also. Ramon Diaz is a coach that a lot of teams really want to have, and he has to show himself now in Copa Libertadores, which is the stage I believe this team is made for. Uh, I think uh, Libertad can, can, can battle uh, the, the local tournaments, but I believe, uh, looking at the players, looking at what, uh, what they've done in their career, I think they're made, uh, they're made to, 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 to really go and, and, and go as far as they can in this Copa Libertadores. That is a typical and which they have to take advantage. Maybe that some Brazilian teams, some Argentinian teams are not in rhythm and they need to get the win fast to, to, to go ahead, to get, to get out of this group zone and, and directly to the knockout stage. 
It certainly is going to be an advantage for a lot of these Paraguayan sides, given that they were the first league to restart since the pandemic. And going into the next team that we'll talk about is Olympia, a side that I think, obviously, we know of the history that they have. You know, Speedly Earth Howard is the most successful team in Paraguay um, in terms of local leagues and international titles. Having won four straight league titles, I think they understand. And I think the, the president, Marco Trovato, and the manager, Daniel Garnero, really wants to contend for that title, to win La Cuarta, as people always want uh, to say. So, you know, Maria, going back to you, certainly Olympia ha also have a challenge where, you know, they're still in, in good position to qualify. You know, they have four points. They're only in second against their rival that they will play on Tuesday in Santos. Um, certainly, we didn't expect the much. We didn't see the, the, the most out of Emmanuel Adebayo, who I think was supposed to be one of the players that was going to help this side contend for the league title. But I'm uh, sorry for the Copa Libertadores, but the team is still talented. I think you look at a lot of the players that had helped that side win four straight league titles. I think the, the emblem in, in the player like Roque Santa Cruz as your captain, um, and looking at the other players that they have at their disposal, mm -hmm. like the goalkeeper Aguilar. Uh, you know, which are these is on that side as well. And, and of course, another new player that had also given a lot of attention real quick and has certainly become a, a rising star was Isidro Pita coming from Sportivo Luqueño to Olympia, uh, a side yes. that will hopefully help him develop into another striker that might have an opportunity on this national team. So I just want your thoughts and, and your assessment of Olympia as they come back into the Copa Libertadores and, and the expectation, because I think they know that, you know, they don't want to set, I mean, they obviously do want to win as many titles as they want, be it a league title or Copa Paraguay, but they deeply know that the main objective was for them to win the Copa Libertadores, and they want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think you said it here. I think they're more, more focused on the Copa Libertadores, hence their um, acquirement of Isidro Pita. Uh, who's a, a very, very talented uh, uh, player. Um, and especially because, uh, well, considering the fact that COVID-19 and, and, and the season got stopped in the middle of the way, um, and seeing as uh, Cerro came back stronger and uh, is winning back-to-back -back games, 10 games, um, like Bella said, um, uh, uh, consecutively, I think they finally re uh, realized that, that they have a stronger uh, position to continue um, playing for the Copa Libertadores, going for that, uh, for the fourth title that like they really want, uh, they've been wanting. And, um, uh, you know, I think, I, I believe the, the treasure that uh, not a, a couple of days ago of Valencia kind of rivals uh, win and, and keep doing so well, um, especially after the last classical that, that they were defeated um, very bad. But um, I think their whole strength is going to go to Copa Libertadores. And I think they have a good chance, although Santos is a strong competitor. We all know um, uh, how well these, uh, this team plays. But considering the fact that last year in Copa Libertadores they made it to round of 16, it's not bad. Um, I think they have a good chance to, to continue uh, uh, fighting for, for a bigger place. Definitely. And I think it's, it's always been the objective for them to go as far as they can. But, you know, they always want to dream to, to win it as well. I think that's always understandable given their history. But looking into another side that has been kind of the wild card and, and maybe the most seasoned team so far in South America, or at least in the Paraguayan football scene. And it's Club Guarani, you know, Ralph, going into you with this team, certainly a side that had to deal in with the qualifying stages all the way since the first stage and now going into the group stage. This is a side that had already been so seasoned in the Copa Libertadores. They already played their first two games, winning one and, and losing one. But, uh, you know, playing against Tigre right now, a side that hasn't won a single game yet, I think they can also put into the advantage that, you know, obviously they have the experience. I think Gustavo Costas has a side that definitely can, can contend to go far in the competition. And looking at some of the, the players that they have at their disposal, you know, we had mentioned someone like Raul Guadilla, who's scoring a lot of goals. We have to mention about Rodney Redes, a young, promising player. Jorge Morel, another player that has experience on, on the national team. And their newest player, Cecilio Dominguez, coming all the way from Independiente. He will obviously go into the United States 
uh, next year, which we'll talk about in a bit. But looking at what needs firepower and looking at the side that they have, they can definitely take the advantage necessary to get those three points against Tigre on Wednesday and, and put them into a, a good spot uh, looking at the differences between uh, all the teams in that group in Group B to qualify to the round of 16. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, Guarani have had, a, have had a good start. They, the game they lost was to Palmeiras, which is it's always difficult against uh, the Brazilian sides. Um, they'll feel that they, they must take all three points against Tigre at home. Uh, Tigre, as you said, haven't even been training recently because of the restrictions in, in Argentina. Guarani, meanwhile, have... They've been on, on a decent run. They've, they lost to, to Cerro Porteño, but then so, so has everybody at the moment. Um, and they lost, surprisingly, to River Plate in the penultimate game. But in general, they're, they're playing some really great football. They're very attacking under Costas. I mean, you, you talked about Boadilla, who has experience in the, in the Bundesliga, and he's been a, a very good signing for them. They, they have Redes with, with his pace, which is always unsettling players. Um, another striker we didn't mention just now is uh, Fernandez, who's, a, who's an amazing goal scorer. He's actually become Guarani's all-time historic top scorer, and he's remembered very much for his goal against Corinthians when, uh, when, they, when they became the first team to defeat Corinthians in, the, in their new stadium. And he also managed to, uh, that game, they, that run, sorry, they almost uh, got to the final. They, they managed to get to the semifinals. Um, so like you said, there's, there's this lot of attacking talent, this pedigree. Um, the signing of Cecilio Dominguez is very interesting. He's a player that is definitely very talented, um, definitely uh, very interesting in terms of someone that can, that can drift out onto the left wing maybe, uh, can create goals, can score goals. Um, one thing is is his motivation, his determination, which will be an important factor to see if he can if he can really fulfil that potential. Um, especially as he's he's almost in limbo right now. He's at Guarani for for six months before he heads to the to the MLS to Austin. Um, but I think in in there they have all this very exciting firepower and attacking players. Um, and then you have somebody like Morel, who I'll tell you a quick anecdote that actually Jorge Morel's first interview was with me, with his first TV interview, back when he was, uh, I think he was 18. Um, we, we did some work with FIFA TV in, in Paraguay. And after I did the interview, he said, he said, oh, that was the first time I've ever done a, a TV interview. Um, he's a very good player. He, he does play in midfield, but he's also played in defense. Um, because he's a, he's a defensive midfielder, but very technical, but they've, they've sometimes used him uh, further back. But he's an, he's an exciting player, and he's very important to that team in terms of keeping balance and, and tempo and rhythm during the games. Um, but all in all, I think Guarani should, should expect to win this game uh, against Tigre, and they're for sure looking to qualify, and then from there, you never know where they... Where, what can happen depending on the draw. And also this year, remember that away games are traditionally very difficult in the Libertadores, but without fans, we don't know exactly what situation that's going to be. Maybe this will even things out more and, and actually help teams, uh, help teams that have, you know, that previously have had very difficult trips. For example, I don't know, Boca Stadium is not going to be the same without fans. So, so let's see um, if that can help some, some of our teams. Will definitely be eerie, but it will, I think, give a good opportunity to these Paraguayan sides heading into the Copa Libertadores. Uh, we'll stick into the Guarani connection real quick. We had mentioned Redes and Dominguez, and we have to talk about these two new players who will also be going stateside. They will be joining Austin FC, the newest uh, team in MLS uh, that will start next season. And, you know, Ralph, looking into what Austin FC is doing, you know, obviously they have a new stadium, they have a and, and a stadium that actually sold out all their season tickets, uh, 22,000 uh, capacity stadium. So there is ambition in terms of growing the sport in a city that is growing. Um, you know, uh, one of the rising, fastest rising cities in the United States, one of the most livable cities to live in the country at the moment. Uh, and it's also the first ever sports team in, in the city of, in the capital of Texas. And certainly it's, it proves a message that, We've seen the impact that Miguel Almiron had when he went to Atlanta United and from the many Paraguayan players that had came afterwards to, to apply their trades in numerous clubs in MLS. 
for them, for this new side, for Austin FC to incorporate two Paraguayans as their first ever players uh, brings a statement, I think, for, for the Paraguayan football scene uh, to the entire world. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it's, it's a huge statement of, of kind of trust, I suppose, trust in, in saying to, to a very young player in Redes and a player that's, that's at a, maybe a crossroads in his career in Cecilio Dominguez that he didn't make that step to Europe, which, which maybe we expected from, from America. Um, so somebody who wants to prove himself and, and they're saying, well, we're putting our trust in you and we're not looking to, to find experienced players from, from Europe who might be coming to retire. I think the MLS has kind of really changed its, its image in terms of it's no longer a retirement league. It's actually a, kind of a mix no, of, of players that come with some European experience, but also a lot of young players, especially from, from Latin America. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's great that they've said to, to Redes and Dominguez, you're the guys that we want to start building this club around because they're, they're the first signings they've, they've made. Um, I think also at this point we should, we should just mention about Atlanta and how Atlanta kind of have, have set the trend or, or really they've become the role model of how these expansion teams in MLS need to, need to try and build themselves. I mean, what Atlanta did was incredible. Uh, firstly, you know, building a very exciting team. They filled the stadium. They managed to, to actually win a trophy very early on in their, in their existence. Um, but it was very interesting that they did that with a lot of young players, a lot of players from, from South America, including, of course, uh, Almiron. Even their coach was, uh, was the former Paraguay national team manager, Tata Martino. Um, so I think a lot of teams are trying to trying to look at that as kind of the gold standard when you're an expansion team in, in the MLS. Inter Miami did something similar. Their, their early signings were, were also from Argentina. Their coach is from Uruguay, who actually used to manage Guarani and, and Olympia, Diego Alonso. Um, and so now we're seeing that Austin are trying to follow a similar, a similar pattern. And I, I think it's going to be great. Um, obviously now everybody in Texas will be supporting... Guarani, <laughs> because they're, they're sending two players over, over here. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a very exciting time, and I think it'll be really cool to see how these players perform in the league. And I think it's also showing that for a Paraguayan community, you know, Maria, I'll go into you on this one. You know, we are a small community of Paraguayan Americans. I think we're about 25, 30,000 who live in this, in this country, um, where Back then, we didn't really have those players to connect to in our own country. I mean, certainly Almiron was one of the first to feel as if, though, we can relate into a player that has done well in a nation and in a league that is growing in the sport of soccer. But now looking into, obviously, these new signings in Redes and Dominguez, you know, you look at what Austin FC are doing, as I had mentioned, you know, sold-out stadium, uh, passionate fan base already. <laughs> even though they haven't kicked the ball yet, the owners are those that are behind the side of the famous actor, Matthew McConaughey, uh, spearheading uh, one of the, the um, on the board of the Austin FC team. But looking at other teams you had mentioned, like Ralph said, you know, looking at Atlanta United with their 77,000 uh, capacity stadium, New York City FC with the, um, the city football group, Inter Miami with David Beckham. I think for many young Paraguayans who have obviously followed in the footsteps of what Amiron did, they are now looking into this opportunity where they can live a good life. They could play, obviously, soccer in the way that they want to. And hopefully, if they do follow the route that Amiron did, will hopefully spear them, spearhead them into springboarding right into Europe and play for the big leagues over there. So this is, I think, a formula that clearly has to work for the young Paraguayans uh, who want to begin their career and, and get it onto the right foot and join MLS. Yeah, I, that's true. I think uh, that, that kind of formula has uh, worked for Almiron, and I think our players are, are looking into that and, and, and following in his steps. Um, obviously, we need to see a lot more players go on the same path in order for us to really say that that formula actually works. But um, changing it up from going from Paraguay to, let's say, Mexico, and then e trying to go into, into Europe, um, I think it's a, it's, a new, it's a new strategy that, that, that it's 
it's working and and Amiron is a it's a true uh, um what's that word he 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 I forgot the word but he he works well for that but um another thing that I love um, about Austin is that um they're they're brand new and they're they're looking for new ways to 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 make this new team and um I think that's what a lot of people like like now um, I actually found out the other day that um, one of the owners of Austin SC is uh, Matthew McConaughey, McConaughey. <laughs> and I thought that's really cool. It's something, you know, that, that a lot of people can relate to. Like you said, uh, Roberto, uh, we need more people to, to find MLS attractive, especially uh, South America. So I think Austin is doing a great job. Um, I think they're looking into the younger players. Obviously, Cecilia is a little older, but um, he, you know, like players like Velez are, are, are a lot younger than that can bring uh, dynamic and uh, passion into uh, the MLS. Now, Fede, going into and closing everything real quick, I, I think it's important that in Paraguay, even though I'm sure they watch MLS there and, and follow all the players that are playing in the league, I think the perception has been changing on this league, and this is not just in the case of Paraguay, but I think all around the world, where it's not the old retirement league where you got Beckham and Gerrard and Pirlo and Slatan go into, into that league, and and now we're seeing these young Parag um, South Americans, you know, or young faces going to the league and to prove that they want to be the best and 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 that they could help their career go into the the stratosphere basically or, or into the right. Uh, form that they want to. I mean, we don't even have to look further than looking at the young players that are already there. Jesus Medina is 23. You know, Gago Romero is in his uh, mid-20s. You have uh, Eric Lopez, who's going to go to Atlanta United. He's 18, is already Flores at Olympia. Uh, Ronnie Red is obviously in the best spot that he is in right now at 20 years old, ho hoping to take that next spot into his career. Cecilio in the prime of his career. Um, you know, Luis Amaria in Minnesota, Christian Paredes in Portland. There are a lot of players that I think are that we're fortunate enough to see and are doing well in MLS. And, you know, I, I just want your thoughts on that whole perception that I think people are giving the league now in Paraguay, especially now seeing that their players are going there and flourishing. You know, a lot of things have happened lately in these last couple of years for Paraguayans to – to look up to the MLS league, I think one of the first things was Nelson Aedo Valdez being champion with Seattle Sounders. Uh, I think that caught uh, a lot of the people's attention here. Hey, look, a Paraguayan doing very well on, on a northern team with, with, with a couple of Mexicans, with, with a lot of South Americans also. So, so then a, a lot of people thought, hey, the MLS could be a, a nice thing to follow. And then Amiron came in and, and he blew everything up. He, he, he took a, a leap all the way to, to Newcastle, to, to Europe. So he's shown the way, like, like you all said. But I, I think uh, Paraguayans have followed. MLS lately and especially with this change with the young kids with the young people going into the league I think it's giving it a, a fresh start it's giving it a, a, a different look and and it's caught a lot of the attention here in Paraguay but some have got some have have done well and some haven't gone have done haven't done the job uh i think like jose uh, josue colman that's already that's came back quick he went to orlando city and he he bounced back with practically barely playing uh, so so some players do go they they they, they pass the test and, and they stay there for a while and some really have just bounced back uh, there's another case in texas with colman that's playing now for barcelona uh, he had an injury it's, it, we have to be we have to be honest about that. I think that that went that didn't go his well. They didn't go his way. But but there's a lot of players that are probably still going to be we tested over there. And Cecilio is going to be one of them. I think Ronnie is going to have more time because because he's young. They're going to have they're going to be more patient with him. But Cecilio is going like a star, uh, and he didn't live up to the expectation in, in America where he was champion, but he didn't make as many goals as people wanted. He didn't make the assist. He he off the pitch he. 
uh, some scandals, not, not, the, not the best calm life. Hopefully he gets that in Austin. Hopefully he, he's committed to the team. Hopefully he is the leader. He becomes that because I think that's what they needed. He's a, the designated. He, he's one of the designated players in, in this team. They, they, they put that pressure on him uh, because, because he's worth it. He's shown that, that, that he can be that kind of player, but he needs to go into this league and really uh, put this team where it wants to be, right? Uh, uh, on the news, uh, making big plays, making big, making big wins. I think that's what the Austin people are going to are gonna want out of Cecilia. And Rodney also, uh, some people have even compared Rodney here to the Mbappé Paraguayo, the, the Paraguay Mbappé. I, I think that's a little big, tough on him. That's a little big on him. But but he has that quality. He, ha he has... He has that style of, uh, of playing, also like like the French striker. So 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 these players are, I, I think, have all the potential to 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 have a great career also in the MLS. I absolutely agree. I think also, you know, given that it is a new team, it, you know, the pressure, and obviously we have to see who they get. Perhaps won't be there, but you know, it, it doesn't matter if they go and win MLS Cup or they finish last. You know, it's all about adapting, and I think I agree. Redis has time on his disposal where he could develop into a good player. And Dominguez has to go into the front foot and be that kind of important player as he is the designated player. And therefore the responsibility is tremendous. So it'll be interesting to see, but I think you have to feel confident in how both those players can do in Austin. And, and hopefully we'll get to see them uh, do well. And thankfully we'll get to see them play well at uh, Guarani as well you know, over the next couple months so again you know this has been quite an interesting discussion guys i'm really excited that we've been able to chat about everything that's going on in paraguay football be it national team be it players that are playing abroad uh paraguayan clubs um, and, and everything that goes beyond that so before we obviously sign off real quick let's go and say where we could find each other. Uh, I'll go first saying that you could find me on Twitter at Roberto Rojas 97, where I'll obviously talk about everything that's going on in Paraguayan football. And, and obviously with the Copa Libertadores starting, with the major European league starting, with obviously the Paraguayan league already in, in uh, is playing, and then obviously the World Cup qualifiers hopefully to start within the next month. I'll be talking about that and, and it'll be, you know, very interesting to see how it all goes. So, Fede, where can people find you uh, on Twitter? Oh, Fede Gol Perez on Twitter, on Instagram. The, that's where I, I usually put all my work up, where, where you're going to find also the link every time for, for these podcasts every week, hopefully. We'll be talking, and it's been a pleasure. It's been fun, and we'll keep at it. Uh, hopefully, uh, more and more people... Uh, from there, from the U.S., from the U.K., from around the world, Paraguayans that, that want to hear about their, 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 their sport, soccer, football, they, they have their spot here now and in English, which I think a lot of people are going are gonna to be grateful about that. And maybe even here in Paraguay, we, we, we have a couple of people that, that want to hear these podcasts and, and this analyst that, that's been really fun to, to, to share with you all. And so till next week. Absolutely. Maria, where can people find you on social media? Yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter at Ceci with two eyes, Brito, Ceci as my middle name, Cecilia. Um, and, you know, I share a lot about any kind of sports uh, nowadays. So it's not specifically just um, soccer. So I do um, like to talk about a little bit of, uh, of different other things. So yeah, I'm looking. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you guys uh, all the time, uh, every week. And um, hopefully everyone likes it, and uh, hopefully they stay tuned uh, every week to uh, all our talks about Paraguay and um, the future that we have in the world of soccer. You know, you have a good point there, Maria. I mean, you know, the NBA playoffs are going on. You know, the Heat are doing well. You know, as we obviously record, uh, they yeah. <laughs> uh, they're in the conference finals. Uh, but NFL is going to start tomorrow, or at least uh, Thursday. So that will be exciting That's to right. to see. And uh, Ralph, you know, obviously you're a fan of all sports and, and seeing that all the sports are coming back at the right time, it's, it's perfect for people to go on to your Twitter feed and check out everything you have to talk about. So where can people find you to talk about everything that's going on in the world of sport? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Paraguay Ralph. Um, yeah, I think it's mostly, mostly football, but there's been a lot of Miami Heat chat. With, uh, with the team doing well, and I'm always talking about 
all different sports, but also use it as a platform to talk to us and, and tell us what you'd like to hear about. What you, you know, uh, there's so many topics we could have covered today, um, but let us know what, what's of most interest. If you're tweeting or you're talking about Paraguayan football in English, also let us know so we can give you a shout out on this platform because our idea is that this grows and that everybody can talk about, uh, about Paraguayan football um, in English, not just in Spanish. So, so let's, you know, and well, not just Spanish and Guarani, but um, yeah, come talk to us, let us know, and we'll be here each week. Absolutely, absolutely. And as always, you know, uh, make sure to give us a like, give us a subscribe, obviously post it on Twitter, Facebook, give it a retweet, like, uh, post it on anywhere that you want on social media. And of course, we appreciate all the comments uh, and suggestions that we are needed. And again, you know, this has been really fun to do, and I can't wait to, to do this uh, every week and talk about everything that's going on in Paraguayan football. And, and I think, obviously, give it a platform that it's needed to get the attention uh, that is necessary. So, for Fede Perez, for Maria Britos, for Ralph Hanna, and for myself, Roberto Rojas, thank you so much for tuning in. Till next time. See you later.